News of the Times The Holborn Horror and Ramsgate Reckoning Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, this is 1865, and two separate but related horrific multiple murders have taken place, utterly shocking the communities, the end death count of five persons unhappily involves mostly children. The case, considered unprecedented and highly disturbing, brings in Scotland Yard. Although the killer is rather quickly caught, the motivations behind it are convoluted and multi-layered. The trial itself is by far one of the oddest we have ever read. What is doubtless a series of murders based on jealousy and the revenge becomes masked by questions of class, privilege and the responsibilities of the state towards those less fortunate. We take a look at this highly interesting case and convoluted series of crimes. The background, the initial appearance of the crimes, the true motivations and the conclusion. For those who like to dip into even more unusual, check out our further particular section where we look at a story from across time. A mysterious woman in black who regular haunts the same place throughout time. We very much hope you enjoy the show. Background. We start this complicated story with the background of Mr. Ernest Southey, also known as Stephen Forward. Two separate identities, two separate lives in two separate towns, with two separate families. From the Grantham Journal, the 19th of August, 1865. So these antecedents, history of the alleged murderer, the man Southey, alias Forward, is stated to be a person of good education and the son of respectable parents. He was at one time a writer in a law office and during his leisure hours he frequented billiard rooms. He seems to be most probably that Southey's real name is Stephen Forward and that he assumed the name of Southey on leaving Ramsgate eight years ago. He is a native of the parish of St. Lawrence, near Ramsgate, and is a baker. He was formerly employed by Mr. Gore of the High Street. He left there and went to Mr. Lacey in King Street, and when Mr. Joad in the same street retired from his business, Forward succeeded him and remained in it about 18 months when he left it, considerably involved in debt. Within his time at Ramsgate, some eight years passed, he left behind his wife and a little girl in a state of almost total destitution. From time to time, anonymous letters would be sent to her, some of which contained small amounts of money, but on the whole, the wife fended for herself, eking out a li living as a dressmaker. From the Sun, London, the 11th of August, 1865. The Tragedy in Holborn. Upon leaving Ramsgate, he moved to Holborn. Here, he became an accomplished gambler, and in progress of a time, a thoroughly blackleg and swindler. Giving up all regular avocations, he made it his practice to visit the different watering places and dressed in the most fashionable style, to throw himself in the way of rich young men and fleece them at his pleasure. It is said that at the present moment several hundred pounds won in this way are still due to him by various gentlemen. Indeed, the name of one nobleman is given who is indebted to him for a sum of nearly two hundred pounds, worth approximately £32,000 today. Mrs. White. Mrs. White, who would become the other major characters in this horrific set of crimes, 
is owner of an equally shadowy history. In the course of his career, he, Southey, made the acquaintance of Mrs. White, the wife of a schoolmaster living, living at Featherstone Buildings in Holborn. His own account of his meeting with her was that one evening he saw her weeping and evidently contemplating suicide on the pier at Margate, and that he felt impelled to ask her the cause of her troubles. She disclosed to him such a history of domestic misery that he felt himself called upon as a man of common humanity to accord her his protection and assist her in every way. But the real facts as to the origin of the discreditable connections were not at all so romantic. According to other and more reliable accounts, it is said that he seduced her while she was living with her husband and at a time not long subsequent to her marriage. On three different occasions, however, she left her husband's home to go and live with her paramour. Indeed, her character was known to be the reverse of respectable. Her course of living was an abandoned one, and it is said that she had liaisons with other men. But her guilty passion for Sally was nevertheless real, and she finally left her home and her husband for him. The three boys that are involved in the terrible series of crimes are Mrs. White's, and possibly, although there are some questions surrounding the parentage, a schoolmaster, her husband, from whom she is separated. Forward stroke Southey and Mrs. White parented a little girl who is indirectly involved in the dramatic scenes which will take place. The Earl of Dudley, Southey stroke forward, Gambling brings him into contact with the Earl of Dudley. It is implied that Southey, stroke forward, is a gambler cheat, but we have no true evidence to confirm this. However, the previous interactions between Southey, stroke forward, will have a profoundly indirect impact on Mrs. White's children. The fact in respect to Earl Dudley's knowledge of Southey, to which reference is made above are as follows. It would appear that the man Southey had, as it had been stated at Brighton and other fashionable watering places, come in the course of his gambling career in contact with gentlemen of the highest respectability and position. Among them was the Honourable Dudley Ward, from whom Southey asserted that he had won one thousand one hundred pounds at billiards, value approximately one hundred and seventy three thousand pounds today. Southey called on the Earl of Dudley and represented the matter to him, and at the same time stated that he had called on his lordship because he was the head of the family and he hoped he would pay the amount. The Earl of Dudley considered the matter and told Southey he could not think of paying his claim for various reasons. In the first place, he did not know that the money was actually due, and in the ne next place, supposing it to be due, it was a gambling debt and could not be recovered in law. His lordship added that if the claim had been made on a tradesman's bill, he would have paid it. But considering the nature of the debt, if he were to recognise it, his fortune would not be able to stand against such claims. He therefore decided to decline to recognise it in any shape or way. A few days later, after the above interview, Southey met the Earl at the railway station when he was about to start for Scotland and again appealed to him to pay his gambling debt. Whereupon the Earl of Dudley told him distinctly that he would not pay it, and gave Southey to understood that if he again obtruded on his privacy, he would hand him over to the police. From that time, Southey never applied to his lordship for money until 
about six months afterwards when he sent Mrs. White on the 12th of March, 1864. On that occasion, Mrs. White sent up the name and the Countess of Shaftesbury, and Lord Dudley immediately came down to his library to see her. On entering that room, he was surprised to find a stranger there and inquired her business. She replied that she came from Mr. Southey for the money, and that was owing to him from the Honourable Mr. Ward, and he, his lordship, then most distinctly refused to recognise the debt and ordered her to leave the house. He left the library, and some time afterwards, returning, was extremely indignant to find that Mrs. White was still standing near the window, he again ordered her to leave the house, and she refused. He then took her by the arm and forced her towards the door, and, as she averred, hurt her very much, to prevent which she caught him by the whiskers. Eventually Earl Dudley got her into the hall and thrust her out of the house, for which she summoned him to the hundred petty sessions at Worcester. The case was heard on the 2nd of April by the esteemed members of the community, including Sir F. C. Winnington and three reverends of the community. Having heard Mrs. White complain against the Earl of Dudley and his answer to it, together with the evidence of a witness who proved that he used no more violence than was absolutely necessary for removing her from the premises, the bench unanimously decided on dismissing the summons. This appeared to weigh very heavily on the mind of Southey, who has ever since been brooding over what he fancied to be a wrong inflicted on himself. But it does not appear that he has again attempted to molest his lordship. Since that period, Southey and Mrs. White have been in cohabitation. The Crime on the 10th of August, 1865, two rooms are reserved for three children, aged 10, 8 and 6, respectively. The children are clean but poorly dressed. It is remarked upon how polite they are, but how very undernourished they were as well. Southey, after checking on them in the evening, locked in the eldest in one room, and the two younger children in the other room, promising to come and collect them the following morning. When he doesn't arrive, concern from staff grows about the status of the young boys. What they find is utterly shocking. From the Express in London, the 10th of August, 1865, shocking murder of the three children in Holborn. A horrible affair came to light yesterday in the neighbourhood of Holborn. On Monday, a billiards marker named Ernest Southey took apartments at the Star Coffee House in Red Lion Street for three little boys of the respective ages of six, eight and ten. They slept there the same evening. In the next day, Southey came and fetched them away, so he said, for a walk in the park. After being out with them for three or four hours, he brought them back and saw them to bed, one of them sleeping in the room numbered eight and the other two in number six. He locked the doors, gave the key to a servant and stated he should be back in the morning. As he did not keep his word, the proprietor of the coffee house at length began to feel uneasy. He therefore called in the police and the rooms were opened and all three children were found to be dead. It is impossible to exaggerate the painful sensation which was caused by this discovery. Medical assistance was called in, but it was of course useless. It may be stated, however, that so far as an opinion could be formed without a regular post-mortem examination, the poor children appeared to have been poisoned with prussic acid. At twelve last night, a reward of a hundred pounds for the apprehension of Southey was offered 
by the Secretary of State for the Home Department. The supposed murderer is thus described. Aged between 35 and 40, by profession a billiard marker, height 5 foot 7 inches, hair dark, eyes dark grey, no whiskers, but a beard of several days' growth, dressed in dark clothes. Pending the inquest, not much trustworthy information can be obtained. It is stated, however, that the deceased were the children of a Mrs. White, whom, it may be remembered some time ago, took proceedings against the Earl of Dudley for an alleged assault. She has since, it is said, been separated from her husband and living with Southey. Another account says, The appearance of the bodies clearly showed that they had expired without much struggling, if any. That is borne out to a great extent from the fact that the youngest child has firmly clinched in her hand a half penny. Medical assistance was at once sent for, and the three children were pronounced to have been dead some hours, and in the absence of an examination of the bodies, the prevailing opinion of the medical men is that death of each was caused by the administration of prussic acid. Whether such was the case or not will be fully inquired into when the coroner's inquest is held. Of course, the post-mortem examination will be made of each body. The children, when brought to the hotel, were not well dressed, but their manners were good. They conversed with a waiting boy and said during the conversation that the person who brought them was not their father. They were taken from their father either to go to school or abroad. On each occasion, when the suspected murderer left, he apologised for the trouble the children might cause, but was assured that they were not at all in the way which appeared to satisfy him. On each occasion, he paid what was due. The man who brought the children to the Star Coffee House is believed to be a billiard marker named Southey. He, for some time, had been living with a Mrs. White, the wife of a schoolmaster, but separated from her husband. Scotland Yard is immediately called in. A full description is generated and sent to all police stations. Plain clothes detectives are dispatched to all local ports and train stations leading out of England. The suspect, known as Ernest Southey, is well known to the police for his prominence in betting circles. However, Southey slips through the net and makes his way to Ramsgate, where he used to live eight years before. Here, he questions locals to attempt to find his wife and little girl, whom he abandoned eight years before. From the Sun, London, 11th of August, 1865. The Tragedy in Holborn. On Wednesday evening, Southey, stroke forward, suddenly appeared in Ramsgate and made his arrival known to his wife. He requested her to take a walk with him, but she declined giving as a reason that as he had been away for some years, he was a comparative stranger, and she did not like being seen out in the evening with strangers. She then invited him to go into the house for a person named Ellis, a dyer residing in King Street. Forward accepted the invitation, and they remained talking in the presence of Mr. Ellis and his daughter, for some time. In consequence, however, Southey stroke forward, having twice stated that he had something to say to his wife, and which he could not say in the presence of strangers, Mr. Ellis and his daughter left the room, but went into the shop which adjoined it. After the lapse of half an hour, the wife came into the shop and said that her husband had promised to come again the following morning. Mr. Ellis then went into the sitting room and forward repeated the promise he had made to his wife and added 
that he would call shortly after eight o'clock. He sat down for some time and told his wife and Mr Ellis about the trials he had to undergo during the time he had been away from her. He further said that he had been abroad and that while away he had saved a sum of £1,170 but had been done out of the whole of it. He then, after renewing his promise to come again the next morning, left. Yesterday morning, about twenty minutes past eight, Forward went to Ellis's house. His wife was there, having some breakfast with Mr Ellis and his daughter. He was asked if he would take any breakfast, but he declined. He sat down and commenced talking. Shortly before nine, Mr Ellis went into his workshop, and while there, his daughter told Forward and his wife that he might have anything to say in private they'll go upstairs they both went upstairs and had not been there many minutes before the daughter of forward went up to them she had hardly got there when mr ellis and his daughter were startled by two rapid reports of a pistol and on the latter rushing upstairs she arrived at the landing just in time to see Forward's daughter fall down dead, she having been shot by the prisoner. She then called out to her father, who immediately came in, and on rushing upstairs, he saw Forward standing at the top of the stairs, just in the sitting room. He said, What have you done, Forward? And seeing that he had a pistol in his hand, he called on him to give it to him, which he did. Forward then had a black moustache and dark whiskers on. Ellis then saw the feet of Forward's wife, and on looking over the table, he saw her head and the blood was oozing thereupon. He told Forward to sit down, and he then perceived that he had neither moustache nor whiskers on. He asked Forward where they were, and he replied that they were under the grate. He looked there but couldn't find them, and Forward then gave them to him. He then called out to send for the police and a surgeon. Forward added, yes, send for a policeman. Policeman arrive and arrest Southey stroke Forward, who goes willingly. He, he questions police if they have heard of a crime in Holborn of three young boys. They have not. Forward requests writing implements and begins a stream of letters that will become part of his defence. From the Nottingham Journal, the 12th of August, 1865, the arrest of Southey. On Thursday afternoon, a telegram was received from Scotland Yard from Superintendent Levy of the Ramsgate Police, to the effect that Ernest Southey was in custody there on a charge of having murdered a woman and a child. It was also been ascertained that the last place the prisoner and Mrs White cohabitated together was at Putney, where the latter, Mrs White, ran away, leaving Southey ignorant as to her whereabouts. This seemed greatly to have distracted the wretched man, and it would appear that, after having perpetrated his murderous work on Tuesday, he must have proceeded directly to Ramsgate, where he met his wife of years ago and afterwards put an end to her existence and that of his child. It has not yet been decided whether the prisoner will be brought to London or remain in the custody of the county authorities. Ramsgate has possession of Southey, stroke forward, for the murder of Mary Anne Gemma Forward, his wife, and Emily Francis, his daughter, and are unwilling to give up possession of him to Holborn, who strongly wish to try him for the murder of the three boys. The Motivation The case is utterly shocking and also grimly fascinating. The press and the public attempt to fathom the motivations and justification of murdering three young boys, 
followed closely by the murder of his wife and a little girl from whom he had been separated from so long. Southey spoke forward, admits to the murders, but claims not to be responsible. The responsible parties, according to his justifications, is a whole host of people, the Honourable Earl Dudley, who he believes cheated him out of money, and various MPs in the government, including Gladstone, for failure of the state to provide. It is his intention, through the forum of the court, to accuse these gentlemen of actually having been responsible for the deaths of his children indirectly, as he puts forth that he had found himself unable to cope with their care and had asked for financial support to help care for his family, but had been refused. From the Grantham Journal, the 19th of August, 1865. During the last six years, Southey has been in the habit of writing to a great number of influential persons in the country, craving aid, and on the grounds of his inability to obtain a livelihood, the Bishop of London, whose purse is always open to such cases, was unfortunately a victim. Some time since, Southey wrote to Earl Russell, stating that he had some very important information to give to his lordship as a member of the government. The strange tone of the letter, coupled with previous communications, induced the noble to send the documents to Sir Richard Maine and Mr. Thompson of the detective department, and was directed to inquire into the then condition of Southey and his antecedents. He was then living at Rose Cottage, Lower Common, near the river at Putney, with the woman White as his wife. From the time of his leaving Brighton, he lived entirely on charity, and while at Putney, he and Mrs. White were in great misery, and he wrote to Earl Russell for assistance, threatening that if he di didn't get it, they would poison themselves. Whilst he has been in prison awaiting his time before the magistrates and at the inquest, he had formulated his defence, which was in effect that it was not his fault. Although not appropriate to do so, Southey stroke forward insists on reading his letters, setting out his claim and insistent that the papers carry the letters to the public no doubt believing that there would be a ground swell of favourable emotion towards him. He was wrong. From the Northampton Mercury, the 2nd of September, 1865, The Southey Murders. As to the mo motive for the commission of the crimes, it seems that he has allowed his grievance against the Honourable Dudley Ward to prey upon his mind, for he had repeatedly said that if he could not get his case before the public, he would destroy his children, who he loved dearer than his life. And while the public would say it was a fearful murder, he should have to tell them that he had given a fair notice of his intentions, and had done it because they were not relieved. He was then brought before the justices and remanded upon the Ramsgate charge after some examination. He applied to the justices for leave to read the papers in open court. He was duly warned not to read it, but he did so regardless. Mr. Livick read the statement from Southey Forward as follows. August the 10th, Police Station, Ramsgate. On Monday the 7th inst, I took three children whom I claim as mine by the strongest ties to the Star Coffee House in Holborn. I felt for these children all the affection that a parent could feel. I became utterly worn out and exhausted of every power of mind and body in my efforts to secure a home and a future for these children, and also another five persons who doubtless were dependent on me. I could struggle and bear up no longer, for the last support had been withdrawn from me my sufferings were no longer supportable. The last hope had perished by my bitter 
painful experience of our present iniquitous, defective social justice. I shall be charged with their murder, with their criminal murder, in the truest and strongest sense of the charge. I deny and repudiate that charge and throw back on the men who have, by their gross criminal neglect, so brought about this sad and fearful crime. I charge back the guilt of the crime on those highly dignitaries of the state, the church and justice, who have turned a deaf ear to my heartbroken appeals, who have refused fellow help to all of my frenzied efforts and exhausted struggles, and who have thereby imperiously denied the sacredness of human life, the mutual dependence of a man, and the fundamental and sacred principles on which our social system itself is based. Foremost among these I charge the Honourable Lord Dudley, the Bishop of London, Sir Richard Maine, Lord Palmerston, the Attorney General, Sir George Grey, Mr Gladstone, the Earl of Shaftesbury, Lord Ewbury, Lord Townsend, Lord Elko, Sir E. B. Lytton, Mr Disraeli, Lord Littleton, Sir John Puckington, Lord Derby, Lord Stanley, Sir Francis Crossley, and the Bishops of Bath and Wells. Under all the terrible run of my life, I did the best I could. Whilst appearing in court and being investigated in Ramsgate, Holborn themselves have been holding their own inquest regarding the then three young boys' murders without the prisoners' attendance. As with Ramsgate, the motivation behind the crimes is what everybody wants to know. What is uncovered is that it seems that there was another reason altogether for the murders of the three young boys. Mrs White, it would seem, had planned to emigrate to Australia in a fortnight with all of her children, her three boys and the little girl that was hers and Southey's, without Southey himself. She had gone into hiding, leaving the little girls with one friend and the three boys with her true husband and schoolmaster. Southey had been looking for her and had left several missives amongst mutual friends, filled with dire warnings to her of the worst kind if she did not come forward before her impending trip to Australia. She stays hidden, and it would seem from here Southey managed to track down the location of the three boys and her ex-husband and take ownership of them. That is where this crime stems from. From The Sun, London, 15th of August, 1865. The Holborn and Ramsgate murders adjourned inquest. Inspector Thompson here informed the coroner that a female named Petty, who had the youngest of Mrs White's children with her, a little girl of about five years of age, might be able to say something. The witness was accordingly examined. Sarah Petty, of 2 Cornelia Terrace, Battersea, then said, Sally came to her house in July last. About three weeks ago, she saw Mrs White in the Edgware Road when she told her witness that she was going to Australia on the 24th. When Mr Southey came to her house, he said to the witness that if Mrs White did not tell her where she was to be found, some harm would come. He wished to get possession of the little girl. Mrs White told her not to say anything about her to Sally, as for the sake of her children she wished to lead a better life, as she had been quite done with him. Sally. The child was left with me by Mrs White in July last. She continues that Mrs White appeared afraid of him. Inspector Thompson of the detective force said the last witness gave him a letter unopened and addressed to Mrs White. He opened it and read it. It urged Mrs White 
to return to the writer Southey, as if she did not, something more terrible than she ever imagined would happen. Further evidence is presented that several days prior to the event, Southey stroke forward had gone to a local chemist inquiring regarding the cost of purchasing prussic acid. The trial. The inquest in both locations having found Southey stroke forward guilty, the trial takes place at the Maidstone Assizes for the murder in Ramsgate of his wife and a young daughter. From the start, Southey stroke forward is a difficult prisoner. There are arguments surrounding which name is to be used, whether he does indeed wish to have a barrister, and, from the aspects of his behaviour, whether he is indeed sane or not. Southey stroke forward makes several attempts to delay the trial, stating he doesn't believe that he will receive a fair trial and requesting a special jury, but Judge Meller, displaying remarkable patience, is made equally of a stern will, and he pushes the trial forward. A jury is empanelled regarding the question of Southey's sanity and finds him sane and suspect that his difficulties and occasional reputation of his own counsel is a feint. His trial for murder is moved forward. The medical testimony confirmed that the young boys died from prussic acid poisoning, with enough found in their stomachs, each to kill three people. As for the murder of his estranged wife and daughter, some of the details are hard to hear. From the Scotsman, 22nd of December, 1865, the trial of Stephen Forward for the Ramsgate murders. The daughter of the, of the dyer was then called and gave similar evidence to that above stated. When the prisoner came, it appeared by her account as well as her father's that he talked quite rationally. When describing what she had heard, she stated very clearly that she'd heard two reports and then a heavy fall, and then, rushing out, she heard a third report and saw the poor child falling, so it was clear that the prisoner had fired two shots in the room and a third at the child as she went out the door. As she got to the child, he put a pistol to the child's mouth, and as witness was rushing away, alarmed, she heard a fourth report, and as he ran across the yard, a fifth. Thus it will be seen there were five shots altogether fired, two in the room, one at the child in the doorway, another at the child as she lay on the stairs, and a fifth either at her or at her dead body or the wife. The witness said that she fainted or lost her senses and could state no more. Whilst she was giving her evidence, the prisoner suddenly began to cry out, but as the evidence went on quietly, without any notice being taken, he ceased and sat quietly down again, listening and taking notes. The witness was cross-examined by the prisoner's counsel, and it was elicited that while he was at Ramsgate, he supplied them with bread and appeared quiet and inoffensive, and apparently carried on business as other men did, and nothing was elicited, either from this witness or the last, who had known him twelve years, to give any colour to the defence of insanity. The surgeon gave formal proof that the pistol shots were the cause of death, a bullet being found in the brain. The pistol, the false whiskers and moustache, and a pair of green spectacles, which also had been used by the prisoner as a disguise, were produced, and also two pieces of printed paper found on him. Southey stroke forward is found guilty, and the papers and the public back the verdict and the court's decision that Southey stroke forward was sane during the time of the crimes. Many articles abound in the papers stressing the correctness of the verdict and the upset that would have taken place 
had Southey stroke forward been found not guilty. Within prison awaiting his execution, Southey continues to hark upon the unfairness of it and his surprise that he had not been found insane in court. From The Sun, London, the 6th of January, 1866. Although Southey acknowledges the kindness with which he is treated by all the officials, he complains greatly of some of the jail regulations. One of his principal grievances is that he is not allowed to be at any time left alone, and that a light is always kept burning in his cell. It is very remarkable that Southey never admits that the murders he committed were crimes. Indeed, he appears to think that he was really done a service to the community, and with regard to his approaching fate, he considered himself as already dead. But the two persons he wished to die with him, Mrs. White and her child, he says, are gone back from life to moral death. The number of eminent persons who were visited by Southey, or to whom he wrote letters and detailed the circumstances upon which eight lives depended, was no fewer than two hundred, and all their names were carefully preserved. He asserts that his immoral union with Mrs. White was not entered into until all hope of the payment of the money he had won at billiards from Mr. Dudley Ward had gone. There is no doubt that for eight months previous to the crimes for which he is condemned, he entertained murderous thoughts against others, and particularly against Lord Dudley. He says that on several occasions he was on the point of shooting his lordship within a few days previous to the perpetration of the other murders. Several rumours have been in circulation as to the efforts making to procure a commutation of the sentence or a respite on the ground of insanity. These rumours have, however, been studiously kept from the knowledge of the prisoner, who entertains no hope that his life will be spared. The execution, it is expected, will take place on Thursday next. The execution, despite many attempts to have his verdict overturned to not guilty by reason of insanity, goes as sentence. Southey, as he is known, convicted of the murder of his wife and child, is executed outside Maidstone Jail on the 11th of January, 18. 66. And what of the mysterious Mrs. White and young daughter? Word had it that she and the daughter emigrated to Australia shortly after Southey's capture. Further particulars. This wonderful story is taken from the classic women in black stories that one can find around the world. This particular story takes place in Syracuse, in 1928. From the Syracuse Herald, the 29th of April, 1928. Syracuse police today, after an interval of almost 10 years, again were confronted with the woman in black. A detective yesterday was assigned to the 5500 block of South Salina Street, where residents reported a mysterious woman garbed in black has been hiding behind trees and frightening children for the last week. Almost ten years ago, veteran police officials recalled yesterday the city literally was held in the grip of terror for months because of the frequent appearances in different sections of a similar woman. That mystery never was solved. The woman in black, despite almost countless theories, remained simply the woman in black. Police yesterday advanced the theory that this woman seemed in the South Salina street block may be the same woman in black. They declared the search for her, which was started yesterday, which will be continued until the mystery is solved. They admitted the possibility the woman in black, as was believed when the figure terrorising the city years ago, may be a man dressed in a woman's clothing. 
they added the caution to residents not to be frightened because the figure at the time of its former appearance committed no crime of violence and requested that the police be told instantly when any suspicious-looking woman appears. The former visit of the woman in black, which ended as suddenly and as mysteriously as it began, left in its wake only one possible solution. The theory was advanced that some mother, crazed by the death of her son in France, roamed the streets at night vainly seeking to find in the faces of passing children some resemblance to the boy who was lost. But, but that was only a theory, neither proved nor discredited, and against it were the claims of many persons, some of whom claimed to have had close views of the mysterious figure, and that the woman in black was a man. The former scare started when milkmen driving their lonely routes in the late hours of the night reported a shadowy figure in black. Some of the men declared they made unsuccessful attempts to catch the figure. Others, after the scare had reached major importance, frankly admitted they fled the scene. One section of the city, after another, reported visits from the woman in black. One nervous householder reported firing, firing a revolver at the figure. The shot took no effect. Workers in a railway yard reported an encounter with the mysterious figure. Then came the story of a man who declared that he had a close encounter with the woman in black. He said the cry that came from the lips of the creature as he attempted to seize an arm was the cry of a man, and he declared the stride of the fleeing figure was the stride of a man. But that, even as the story of the crazed mother, was probably only a theory. The woman in black remained shrouded in mystery. That mystery remained unsolved when she disappeared. For a while it was the leading topic of conversation. Then the city turned to other things. The mystery, so far as the police were concerned, was reopened when the black-garbed figure was seen yesterday. The woman in black is back. That concludes this episode of the Holborn Horror and Ramsgate Reckoning. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, we would be really grateful if you could like and subscribe to our channel. The likes and subscriptions help to keep our small channel alive. Do be sure to check out our community posts on our channel page every Sunday, which will tell you what episodes are coming out the following week. And if you have a liking for the lighter side of Georgian, Victorian and Edwardian stories, check out our sister channel, Chronicle of the Times. The link is on our channel page and below. Thank you again, everyone. See you next time. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.